if they don't like them, they don't buy them. So that the industry as a, as a viable, uh, legitimate growing industry uh, is in flux right now, from my point of view. I see it as a very uh, tenuous time for anime because at a certain point, people just throwing one title after the other just to keep the cash flow going from their uh, distributors, or from their uh, retailers. And now, you know, people are more discriminating. You've seen so much of it, and the stuff that's new is marginal. Even in Japan, uh, the Japanese animation industry is, is collapsing. Uh, a lot of people think that it's uh, overly uh, oriented from the uh, creative point of view uh, by fans. So it's like a second generation of, uh, of creators who don't have that spark of genius that brought anime to the forefront 25 years ago, or even 10 years ago. So the new animation is hit and miss. Where back in the late 80s and 90s, you could be guaranteed that you'd be seeing something really cool if you watched a new anime. Now, you don't really have a guarantee. You can follow a certain director or follow a certain writer or a designer, but uh, there's no guarantees that you're going to really get what you see. So, what I see is that it's uh, it's uh, like a roller coaster ride. Right? It's uh, on the downs. I don't know if anyone agrees with me, but that's just. Uh, my outside opinion. Actually, Tony, since you've been a producer through all these years since uh, Rotec, uh, how do you feel the enemy industry has changed since then? Well, I agree with an awful lot of what, what Carl just said. It's been, a, it, there was an awful lot of, I mean, we, there was a time in the 90s where, you know, if it was Japanese, somebody threw it up there and threw it out, and, uh, and uh, that, that can't be sustained over time, and that combined with, with some of the new technology, which has allowed more piracy, um, and that sort of thing has really put a damper on it. And when you think about the fact that the people who have to who have to fund the, the bringing over of the shows, they, they see a, a title on the internet uh, someplace for free, and, and they're not so willing to put the money out. Uh, you, you bring that in with a, with a, with a, all the economic problems that have happened, and, and yeah, the anime industry is in kind of a, a flux and in a tenuous position. Um, it's, and it's happening even in Japan. It's not just here. Um, on the other hand, anime has also become far more mainstream uh, in, in terms of our culture. Not that, that anime has changed, but we as a culture have changed more to accept it. And the influences have been seen in, in, in almost every segment, in motion pictures, in comic books. Um, so it's an interesting thing where, where I see the demand increasing. And, uh, and if there's a good story and it's well presented, it will, it will surface and come out. But it's becoming increasingly more difficult. Hopefully, um, that will eventually balance out and come back around as, as things tend to do cyclically. Well, I, I, the one thing that you can see is, if you look at the numbers, pick, pick an average number of an ADV type, let's say. It could be 1,000 units, could be 10,000 units, but average, it's low. Then you look at something like uh, Animatrix or Batman, the, is the Dark Knight? Yeah. And this new thing that's the Halo Legend, it's going to be coming up. That's the future of anime. It's that East meets West uh, venue where you get samurai. Yeah, for samurai, where you get um, you get Western storytellers exploiting uh, Asian talent, Pacific Rim talent, Japanese, Korean, wherever they can find it, to make stories in this thing. And a lot of it has to do with the pioneering work that all of us did early on to get it into the public consciousness, <laughs> either in theaters or on TV. I mean, I sold stuff to MTV. I sold stuff to Turn. I sold stuff to Sci-Fi Channel. This is in the early 90s. So we're talking, you know, almost 20 years ago. So after 20 years, it kind of filters in. And there's cable channels like uh, Showtime Extreme that shows stuff. And, G4 and you know a Chiller and all these other places, so it's starting to filter in. But what they're showing on those channels is not necessarily great. So the hit miss it comes and goes. Yeah. So the, the the key for me is East meets West. Halo Legend, The Dark Knight, and the Matrix shows you what you can do with a proper budget because most of the anime is produced in Japan for domestic 
Japanese domestic consumption works under a very low uh, budget. And you don't really have that, uh, that beauty that you see in these more uh, highly funded projects. Money makes a big difference. And uh, one other question that we got from uh, Facebook, um, actually it was multi-part, was uh, what, a, what else is in store for Roatech after the Shadow Chronicles? And uh, as many of you know, uh, the biggest project in Harmony Gold after uh, Robotech the Shadow Chronicles that we began is uh, Robotech Shadow Rising. Uh, that project started almost immediately after uh, Shadow Chronicles uh, hit the market. However, this was, uh, this was because this was to be the biggest project to drive new Robotech sales and to expand the universe. However, we were thrown a curveball uh, not too long ago. And uh, this was from another company. I mean, we kind of thought, okay, Funimation is the largest company in the anime industry. We can't get any bigger than that, right? But, of course, you know, if you think outside of the anime box, just like the way Carl was talking, you know, you reach a whole new market out there, not just your anime audience. I mean, you know, I mean, Robotech, uh, when it hits the 100,000 mark in terms of DVD sales, I mean, it's hitting plateau that you know, almost no other anime titles can hit because most, even <coughs> if an anime title is a hit, you know, it hits maybe 25,000 units. I mean, when you go past 100,000 units, you're going into Afro Samurai territory or, you know, Evangelion or something like that. That happens very, very rarely. But when you get into the like, million selling mark, you're getting into stuff like Animatrix or Gotham Knight. I mean, stuff where you get, you know, super brands. And both of those titles, were managed by Warner Brothers, you know, just to, So we're really excited to be uh, working with them on the live action film. And they put together a killer production team, Akeem Goldsman, who's got Oscars, Jason Netter, who not just did Rotex Shadow Chronicles, he also made Wanted into a huge hit. And some uh, other gentleman who doesn't need much of an in introduction. Everybody's wondering, yeah, what's he doing next? It's gonna be Rotex, it's gonna be the Hobbit. Nobody knows. One thing I'll tell you is, you know, with a career like his, he can, in my opinion, this guy can do pretty much anything he wants. And uh, let's see, uh, also uh, they've put together incredible writers working on it. They've got Lawrence Kasdan, who's written The Good Star Wars. And uh, got Miles Miller, which some people think wrote The Good Spider-Man. And, and uh, Tom Ralph Smith. Now this guy's an interesting new uh, addition to the team. A lot of people are wondering, you know, who is this guy? You know, well, he's a New York Times best-selling author, and he's become uh, he's become almost like uh, Ridley Scott's new Logan boy, where he's using him on another one of his projects. And one of the things he wrote was Child Forty Four, which is an alternate history of the world, where you know it's an alternate historical timeline of what the USSR could have been, you know, in his. Uh, alternate timeline, and you think about what Robotech is with the addition of alien technology, you know, changes the course of human history. You hear it from the very first episode, so I think this guy's a very relevant addition to the team. So, you know, uh, we're very excited. I, I mean, I'd love to talk more about the inner workings of what's going on, but you know, of course, you know, when it's at this early developmental stage, we just can't, we can't comment, so it'll all come out in due time. And uh, new Robotech merchandising will be managed through the WB. We're uh, working with them with their uh, consumer products group. And so we're just looking forward to so much uh, coming out after this. And uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're really short on time. We might only have a question for like a question or two more. But we'll be back for tomorrow's uh, you know, free for all meeting where you can just pepper us with questions. Uh, you, sir. Uh, really fast, I want to say this one. Check out this show. We've got super Robotech. I didn't know you had so many to choose from when you created an excited cheese series. I think Macross was a very big series. So I crossed out so much, most got well expected. Do you remember any of the other series that you had to choose from? Yeah, nothing was um, 